Good morning. Welcome to CMC Markets on Friday, the 27th of May. And this quick look ahead at the week beginning the 30th of May in what is going to be a shorter week than normal. We've got two bank holidays on Thursday and Friday to celebrate Her Majesty the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, 70 years on the throne. So the main item of the week will be on the Friday. It'll be non-farm payrolls. Um, and that could well give a little bit of an indication in terms of wage growth as to whether or not the Fed is likely to pause after the 250 basis point rate hikes that are priced in for June and July. Before we get on to that, uh, the payrolls data, I think it's always a good idea to look back at the week just gone. And it's been a broadly positive week across the board. Um, FTSE 100 is up around 75.60. Um, posted some fairly decent gains this week. It's up over 2% over a five day period, which is not too shabby in the slightest. Fairly, fairly decent, um, fairly decent uh, return and back in positive territory for the year. We can see that based on this little Bloomberg feature here, which is quite nifty for any of you who use Bloomberg. Over the past five days, the best performers this week have been Ocado, which is up 13%, um, with a good portion of that gain on the back of this week's announcement of a windfall tax or an energy price levy, or whatever you want to call it. Um, and, you know, I think that that's really been the headline for the week. The the I wouldn't say it's an unexpected decision by the government to U-turn on a windfall tax, even though it was only just over a week ago that they whipped their MPs to vote against a windfall tax. Um, but uh, on Thursday, they announced a plan to raise up to £5 billion over uh, the next year or so, which will go towards helping funding new measures to help 8 million people on means-tested benefits with a one-off payment of £650. Um, as well as £400 payment for everybody else to help with higher than expected energy bills. And while the help is very welcome, certainly to um, the more cash-strapped members of society, I think you can be for basically the Chancellor taking measures to help out the um, consumer without actually approving of the means of which he's chosen to do it. And certainly I think it doesn't send a particularly wonderful message that the UK has a coherent industrial or energy strategy. BP has already announced that it is reviewing its investment in the North Sea and more broadly the UK. And let's not forget that BP is also at the forefront of the green hy hydrogen revolution and is due to make a decision, take a decision next year on a green hydrogen facility in Teesside, 2023. They've, they've announced it um, and earmarked some funds for it, but a final decision is going to be taken in 2023. So the fact that also that it's not a one-off tax, but it is going to be implemented this year, 2023, 2024, with a sunset clause the end of 2025 suggests uh, su suggests um, you know sort of an, an Oliver Twist type um, attitude towards the oil companies. Please, sir, can I have some more? Um, unfortunately for um, the UK oil and gas sector, it's not BP and Shell's share prices that are really borne the brunt of this decision. It's the smaller players of Serica Energy and Enquest. And these, you can you can see the impact um, on this chart here over the course of the last two days. I mean, these companies generate less than about one and a half billion dollars of revenue per year. Um, so it's not as if there's an awful, awful lot of profits to play with. And then you've got Harbour Energy, which was born out of the ashes of Premier Oil. Um, it's got debts of over two billion pounds. Um, and obviously, in terms of investing in UK oil and gas, um, this is a significant blow to the smaller players 
in the oil and gas sector who in recent years have struggled to get the investment to essentially get this transition fuel um, into renewables. So again, big, big, big falls there in Inquest and also Harbour Energy as well, which is in the FTSE 100. You can see that chart there, fallen quite sharply over the course of the past few weeks when talk of a windfall tax first became mainstream. And obviously BP and Shell, they've been able to absorb the worst of it simply on the basis that um, they make an awful lot of their revenue outside the UK. So essentially, um, they, 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 they sort of come out of it an, an awful lot better. And um, I think that's the key message. I think, um, you know, when we when we look at this windfall tax, while it may, may raise an awful lot of money in the short term, in the longer term, it doesn't really send a particularly positive message. And then you can see that here in the five day performance of the FTSE 100. Um, the government has also held open the possibility that they could widen the tax to the utilities providers, the electricity grid providers. So SSE, Scotch and Southern, it's down 9% over the past five days. National Grid, down 3.3%. You know, and the problem here is not so much about the fact that, you know, we, we can't buy gas. Actually, spot gas prices are well below three month forward gas prices. We don't have storage. We don't have infrastructure, green infrastructure to be able to, you know, to store this renewable energy and then use it as and when we need it. So when you're talking about L, uh, when you're talking about Shell um, investing 25 billion pounds over the course of the next decade, BP investing 18 billion pounds over the next decade, you're probably going to need an awful lot more than that to upgrade the grid infrastructure as well as the storage capacity and pretty much everything else when it comes to making this transition from fossil fuels to renewables. Anyway, so um, pretty misguided decision to levy a windfall tax. I think at the moment, the government needs to, um, I think really focus on a much longer term uh, energy strategy rather than the short termist measures. It, tends, it seems to stagger to and fro from um, on a week to week basis. Anyway. That is sort of by the by. Let's look at the wider market because the wider market um, is looking pretty positive this week, which does seem a little bit counterintuitive when you see, when you look at some of the, the moves that we've seen, particularly in retail stocks over the course of the past week or so. And we have seen a bit of a turnaround in the retail sector. Um, obviously, the windfall tax has had a part to play in that in terms of replenishing. Um, the, the wallets of consumers, essentially giving them slightly more wriggle room when it comes to their disposable income. So you could essentially call um, this week's mini budget, if you want to call it that, um, a fiscal stimulus, which in fact it is. The downside to that is it probably makes a Bank of England rate hike or multiple Bank of England rate hikes this year, over the course of the rest of this year, much more likely because of concerns about potentially higher inflation. And obviously the downside to this windfall tax is it could actually result in slightly higher oil prices as well, oil and gas prices, um, or more, should I say, more expensive prices at the pump as um, uh, these companies try to restore some of the margin here that they're likely to take as a result of this windfall tax. So you know, these, these sorts of measures do have unintended consequences, notwithstanding the damage it does to the UK's reputation as a stable investment area. So um, thus far, we've seen a fairly positive um, market reaction. US markets look as if they're going to they're going to post the first weekly rise um, in eight weeks, which is always welcome getting a decent rebound in this chart in the S&P 500 here. Potentially, that could be a bullish weekly reversal, which if it plays out the way that it, that, that, it, that it could well do, 
we'd need to see a break above 4,100 on a weekly basis to signal a move back towards um, this trend line resistance from the peaks that we saw here. So I'm going to draw that trend line in there. Keep an eye on that over the course of the next few weeks. If we break this support, this sorry, this this resistance area around about 4,100 over the course of the next few days. One of the one of the other catalysts, I think, for the rebound in markets has been the sell-off in the dollar over the course of the past couple of weeks, but also the weakness in US Treasury yields, which I talked about last week as well. We do appear to have hit a short-term top when it comes to US Treasury yields. So we've got, I talked about this bullish reversal back here. I then talked about the bullish reversal on the weekly chart um, a couple of weeks ago. And again, we've drifted back down again. So, you know, if, you, if you're working on the basis that um, you could well see inflation potentially starting to top out, we'll know a little bit more about that with the PCE numbers, which are due out later today. Um, but also in terms of some of the comments that are starting to come out from the Federal Reserve with respect to, we'll probably get another 250 basis point rate hikes, one in June and one in July. But the Atlanta Fed President, Raphael Bostic, has floated a little bit of a trial balloon this week. Could we see a pause in September? I think we'll get better clues about September in the aftermath of Jackson Hole in August, because Jackson Hole generally tends to be a fairly key um, way sign, if you like, in terms of what the Fed is looking to do over the course of the rest of the year. So you'll get the 250 basis point rate hikes, one in June and one in July. What happens after that? You could get clues to that with respect to Jackson Hole. There's also the prospect that the ECB might be looking to raise rates in July as well, and September potentially. Um, I struggle with two rate hikes this year. I struggle with the idea of two. We might at a pinch get one, which would bring the, the main headline rate from minus 0.5 to zero. Um, but given where energy prices are now, given that they're not likely to come down anytime soon, you do have to struggle to wonder where the growth is going to come from in the euro area. Um, you know, you can, and also inflation is still at record highs. CPI, EU CPI is due out. Um, flash CPI for May is due out on the 31st of May, and that's expected to um, stay at a record high of 7.5% and potentially head higher to 7.6. Now, core prices are less than half of that; they're around about three and a half percent. But nonetheless, you've got a wide cross section. Of inflation rates across the euro area. You've got 4.8% in France. That's largely due to the French government capping energy prices um, and imposing essentially the losses on EDF and the energy, energy company there and then bailing them out. Um, but in places like Estonia, headline CPI is 18.8%. It's 16.8% in Lithuania. So the, the euro area does have an inflation problem. It's just masked by an average on the headline number for EU CPI. But the ECB, you know, does have to set interest rates for the wider area. And certainly I think there is pressure being brought to bear on Christine Lagarde to raise rates in July. And certainly she said that that will happen in July. She sort of held herself to a little bit of a hostage to fortune. Um, so if the data deteriorates between now and July, she's going to find it very, very difficult to resile from that commitment. And that could be a problem going forward. We've also seen weakness in the dollar. And I think that has helped the broader risk recovery that we've seen over the course of the past few days. And we can see that in this daily chart here. Let's stick some moving averages onto that. There we go. And again, it's the 50 day moving average. It could almost be, um, you could almost inter, you could almost overlay the US 10 year treasury yield over that chart because they're almost identical in terms of look and feel. The only difference is that the part, rather than three weeks of declines, um, which the US treasury yield has, this is the second for the US dollar index. And, you know, it's a fairly decent 
uh, run of run of declines. It's probably the worst run of declines since August, September last year, when we declined two weeks in a row there. Oh, well, we did there as well, but we're talking we're talking fairly big declines over the course of the past couple of years. Um, we look at the three-year chart. We can see it. We can see it there. So there's certainly room to pull back a little bit further. There's also room. I think you can argue that um, we could have further um, to fall, maybe back towards 100 over the course of the next few days. Now, of course, that potentially means that euro dollar could move higher. Um, and at the moment, we do appear to be starting to see evidence of a little bit of a base starting to form. We are pushing up against the 50-day moving average. We're also pushing up against trend line resistance from the peaks in January. So how we behave around about 108 is going to be very, very important in the wider scheme of things when it comes to the direction for euro dollar. This is now no longer valid. What this doesn't do is undermine my wider view that euro dollar goes lower um, through 103.40 towards parity. The only difference is that that move is likely to take place over the course of the next couple of years. In the short term, we could get a move all the way back to 111 without undermining that scenario. What we don't really want to see, I think, is a move back above into this triangle breakout here, because essentially that's probably going to completely um, undermine my bearish euro scenario. But ultimately, the big test will come around about 108, 108, 2030. If we break back above these sorts of levels here, we could see a wider correction, a euro correction towards the upside. In terms of cable, we're still underperforming relative to euro. Again, we're looking a little bit overbought, but we're approaching the 50-day moving average. The narrative around potential rate hikes has changed somewhat with this week's fiscal stimulus. I think there was an inflow, there was a little bit of concern that the economy would stagnate. Um, Q3, Q4. Um, obviously, this week's measures announced by Rishi Sunak have mitigated that to a certain extent. And also, let's not forget the national insurance thresholds are also being raised in July. So that's an additional boost to incomes. Um, and essentially, the entire package that he's announced this week, it was £15 billion. But if you add all the measures up, the other measures up that he announced earlier, it comes to somewhere close to 30 billion pounds, of which only 5 billion of that will be raised by the windfall tax, always assuming that, of course, it even raises that much. And yeah, there are investment incentives within that. Um, 90, for, every, you know, for every pound invested into um, the UK economy, you get 91p back. So essentially a super deduction. But I think the wider thing is here, while that is welcome, the narrative around the imposition of the tax has been such that you don't say that you're not going to do it one minute and then go and do it the next, because ultimately it then makes businesses doubt everything that you say about your energy policy and your, and your industrial policy going forward, because your word can't be trusted. You know, you're telling me that you won't do this one minute and then you go and do it the next. You know, that's not the sort of narrative that you really you know, if you're a business and you're going to be investing billions of pounds into an economy that you want to hear from the political leaders of the day. So in any case, um, digressing slightly, cable, big, big resistance around about 126.20.30. Um, we have we have edged higher, um, posted a high of 67 today. I really want to see a move back to 128.30. And then a move through 128.30 um, to signal a potential base is in. Certainly on the daily candle, um, the picture is encouraging on that basis. So I would certainly argue that we could well go all the way back to 131 over the course of the next few weeks. But for now, I think we have potentially um, found a little bit of a base. And the big question is now, how much can we rally? Because the, certainly think in the wider context of things, this week's events have made more rate hikes much more likely 
from the Bank of England, that should be sterling positive. And that's really reflected in the way euro sterling has behaved over the course of the past couple of days. We've struggled to get much above 86. Um, now, that's not to say that we won't see another test of it. But ultimately, we're still in the same range we've been we've always been in for most of this year, between 82 and 86. And I think that's unlikely to change in the short to medium term. So I would continue to play that particular range for the foreseeable future. Um, what else have we got? We've also got um, we've got services PMIs. I mean, to be quite honest, those are a waste of space, um, given the concerns about rising input costs, um, rising inflation disruptions to supply chains, I'm actually surprised that they're as positive as they are. They certainly don't give a very, very accurate reflection of where the economies are. If you look at, say, for example, the flash PMIs that we saw from Germany, France and the UK, we saw a big fall in the UK services PMI to 51.8. Well, that's not surprising, given the tax rises that we saw in April. May, the May services PMI fell from 58 to 51.8. It was a really big fall. Hopefully, this week's events will see a little bit more confidence seep back in um, over the course of the rest of the quarter. We've also got UK lending data. Um, net consumer credit has recovered after a slow start. That's due on the 30th. That's on the Monday. Um, look to see whether or not there's going to be a little bit of a recovery in that. Um, we've also got the Bank of Canada rate decision. And we're expecting a 50 basis point rate hike here. Why? Simply because um, Canadian economy is doing well. Inflation rose, CPI froze to its highest levels since 1990 in, week, in numbers released earlier this month, 6.8%. Unemployment is low at 5.2%. So the Bank of England is likely the Bank of England, the Bank of Canada is likely to get out in front of the Federal Reserve by hiking its um, policy rate from 1% to 1.5%. Now there's an outside chance they might go 75. I would be surprised if they did, but with all the discussions going on about where the neutral rate is you do sort of have to question whether or not they will go um, any harder than 50 basis points, even though there has been talk that the Federal Reserve might start to look at 75 basis points in over the course of the next couple of months. The main number for the week is non-farm payrolls. And um, I think the, the, the key takeaway for that is not so much the resilience of the labour market. We know that's pretty strong. I don't think that's going to change. 428,000 new jobs were added in April. The March number was revised lower to 428,000. So we got a nice bit of symmetry on March and April jobs numbers. Average hourly earnings remain steady at 5.5%. Now I find that a little bit counterintuitive. Why? Because inflation's high. And there's 11.1 million vacancies um, in the US economy, and you've got an unemployment rate um, at 3.5%. So neither of these numbers are expected to move the dial that much when it comes to monetary policy. It's wages growth, which is likely to offer clues as to whether or not um, there is starting to see, we are starting to see increasing price pressures starting to build up in the wake of very high inflation. Now, they're around about 5.5% um, average hourly earnings in the US. Um, that seems, that feels like they should be an awful lot higher, given the number of vacancies, they're not. Um, so I think in terms of the wages numbers, we want to see these holding up or even actually rising. Um, and the mystery is why that's not happening. Now, I'm looking at the estimates at the moment for US wages growth for um, next week's May numbers. And 
To say that I'm surprised is an understatement. Markets are pricing in a fall to 5.2%. So that just completely runs completely at odds to what I would think should be happening when it comes to wage growth. So we'll see whether or not that plays out, but we don't want to see, we don't really want to see a weaker number there. And if we do get a weaker number, then obviously that's potentially going to be dollar negative going forward. So that's payrolls due on the 3rd of June. There won't be a payrolls webinar due to it being the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. And um, we're having a street party, so I'll probably be out toasting her match. Um, but in terms of earnings announcements next week, there's only a couple that really caught my eye. B&M European Retail is a discount retailer here in the UK. Um, has seen a little bit of a recovery in the past couple of days on the back of that budget announcement. Um, hopefully that will arrest some of the declines that we've seen in the retail sector, consumer discretionary. We've seen a broad mix of numbers. Obviously we saw those really big misses in the US from Walmart, from Target, and what have you, but we've seen some fairly decent beats from Dollar Tree, Dollar General, um, Nordstrom, and Macy's. So the US consumer is still out spending money. They're probably just being slightly more picky about where they spend it. So um, while things are never as bad as they seem, they're also never as good as they seem. They're sort of somewhere in between. So I think when you're trading these markets, you basically have to adopt, adopt a policy of, yeah, all doom and gloom on over here. Okay, fine. Talking your book. All sweetness and light over here all good you know nothing is ever as good as it seems but neither is it as bad and i think that's really the the attitude that you really have to adopt um having said that looking at bnm european retail it's still done pretty well um over the course of the past couple of years and it's still well above its um pre-pandemic or post-pandemic first lockdown lows we'll call them that shall we the other one is the M&A that we saw this week, Broad, Broadcom, which is semiconductor to maker. Um, done very well from the chip shortage. Um, we slipped back from the record highs of earlier this year in much the same as the rest of the sector, um, like its peers, NVIDIA, Intel, AMD. It's a much more diversified business and they become, or are set to become even more diversified um, it makes chips for iPhones, industrial equipment. It also has a data center business and a software services business. So looking at the numbers and its decision to buy VMware, cloud company VMware, as part of a $61 billion deal um, in order to diversify its revenue streams even more, has seen the company, after an initial dump over the course of the first part of the week, recover an awful lot of those losses and hold above that key support level there. So one and a half billion break clause in the contract on either side of the deal if they decide to pull out. But ultimately, I think it's um, it'll be a fairly, fairly interesting set of numbers and it will certainly be interesting in the context of where they see guidance going forward. The fact that it's broken below the 200 day moving average is a little bit of a worry and also the fact that it hasn't actually got back above it yet it's hold of these lows here we now need to see it get back above the 200 day moving average to reintroduce the uptrend that's been in place um, um, over the course of well look at this here over the, since since um since the lows back in march 2020. other companies reporting next week we've got hp um, first quarter, second quarter numbers on the 31st of May, and we've got full year numbers from Dr. Martins. Otherwise, that's it for um, this week, ladies and gentlemen. Um, once again, thank you very much for listening. Hope you all have a great weekend. And um, if I don't speak to you before, hope you all enjoy the Platinum Jubilee. Thanks very much for listening.